Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to networking in Domain 4 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the second of four videos for Domain 4. I've included links to other mind map videos in the description below. These mind map videos are one part of our complete CISSP masterclass. Continuing our discussion from the OSI model in the previous video, we're now going to dig into a bit more detail around networking concepts such as wide area networks, wireless, IP addressing, authentication, network attacks, virtualization, and some common tools. And we'll start with wide area networks. Networks that are spread over a large geographical area, an entire country, continent, or world. There are a few protocols that have been created over the years to enable wide area networks that you should know about. X25 was one of the first protocol suites for packet switched networks across a WAN, a wide area network. X25 was first published back in 1976, meaning it came out even before IP version 4 and the OSI model. Frame Relay mostly replaced X25. ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, then mostly replaced Frame Relay and MPLS, Multiple Protocol Label Switching, which can encapsulate various protocols, including Frame Relay and ATM, has become the dominant wide area network protocol today. Now on to wireless. We are relentlessly marching towards our wireless future. Can you even remember the last time you used a phone that was plugged into your wall and used a landline to call someone? Remember when our computers used to have a plethora of ports on them? Like, look at all the stuff you could plug in. Now you get this, and you should count yourself lucky that you still have a headphone jack there. Nowadays, you either go wireless with everything, or welcome to dongle hell. One of the biggest challenges with wireless is that signals are much more easily intercepted. Instead of having to physically break into a building to connect to the corporate network, you can now just sit in the parking lot in your van and hack the planet. Encrypting wireless traffic is therefore extremely important. So let's talk about some of the various wireless technologies that we use every day and the security challenges associated with them. Let's start with Wi-Fi, a technology which we pervasively use to create local area networks without any wires. Well, you need to plug your wire, your Wi-Fi access point into a physical network, but let's not get pedantic here. IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, 802.11 is the protocol we use for wireless local area networks. There have been many generations of 802.11 ratified over the last 20 plus years. You should recognize the following 802.11 standards, 802.11a, 802.11b, g, n, ac, and ax. These different versions of 802.11 represent the evolution of the standard towards ever greater bandwidth and capabilities. As I mentioned, it is critically important to encrypt wireless traffic as it is so much easier to eavesdrop on a wireless network. One of the first wireless encryption protocols created was WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy. WEP absolutely does not live up to its name. Very significant flaws have been found in the WEP algorithm related to how it implements the RC4 encryption algorithm to encrypt wireless traffic. Specifically, the initialization vectors used are far too short meaning that WEP encryption can be easily broken. As such, WEP should never be used. This was a huge problem when it was first discovered, and a band-aid solution needed to be quickly found to prop up WEP until new wireless encryption protocols could be created and ratified. The band-aid solution that was created for WEP was TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. TKIP has subsequently been found do also have significant flaws and should therefore not be used. WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access, was also meant as an interim protocol to help deal with the WEP fiasco until the next much better protocol, WPA2, could be ratified. WPA uses TKIP for encryption by default. WPA2 uses the AES encryption algorithm by default, and AES is much better than TKIP. Wi-Fi is used for creating local area networks, with a range of about 100 meters. WiMAX, Wireless Interoperability for Microwave Access, is a protocol for creating wireless metropolitan area networks, wireless networks that range up to 90 kilometers. 
the IEEE standard behind WiMAX is 802.16. Now let's talk about a couple of protocols used for mobile phones. GSM, Global System for Mobiles, and CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access, are wa both wireless radio protocols used for cellular companies to provide 2G and 3G voice and data services. GSM has a couple of significant security issues that are worth noting. It is vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. An attacker can create a rogue cell tower which phones will connect to, allowing the attacker to intercept. It is also possible to clone SIM, subscriber identity module cards, by extracting a user's IMSI, International Mobile Subscriber Identity, allowing an attacker to make calls and receive calls and also receive a user's SMS messages. This SMS cloning attack can be done over the air. GSM and CDMA have largely been replaced by 4G slash LTE. And now, of course, we have 5G networks. Microwaves are not just for unevenly heating your hot pockets. Microwaves are also a good way of cost-effectively creating data links between buildings that are a few miles apart. Now, let's talk about the major way that we can ensure data sent across a network gets to the intended destination. <laughs> One more time. IP, Internet Protocol, Addresses. As I mentioned in the previous video, it is useful to think of an IP address as being similar to a post address for a house. If you want to send someone a letter through the mail, you need their address, and that address needs to be unique to them. IP addresses serve the same function on a network. The pervasively used version of IP currently is version 4. It's worked great for decades, but there are some big limitations. The address space, the total number of unique IP addresses, is only 2 to the power of 32, or 4,294,967,296 possible addresses. When IP, for was, when IP version 4 was first ratified back in 1974, and there was no internet, 4.3 billion addresses probably sounded like an absurdly large number that we would never run out of. But here we are in 2023, with over 7 billion people on the planet, and many of us using multiple IP addresses. I just checked, I'm currently using 67 IP addresses on my little home network. Crazy. Granted, I'm a wee bit of a nerd. The point stands though. 4.3 billion IP addresses are not nearly enough. Plus, IP version 4 has no security built into it. IPv6 addresses both of the problems just mentioned with IP version 4. The address space for IP version 6 is 2 to the power of 128, or 340 undecillion possible addresses. That's this number here, by the way. Actually, it's not. 340 undecillion is actually this number here. It's a very, very large number. We should be good for at least a couple more years with this many addresses. Once the internet manages to switch over to IP version 6, that is. Another big advantage of IP version 6 is that capabilities for encryption and integrity checking are built right in. Whereas with IP version 4, we had to duct tape these capabilities on later. The IP version 4 addressing system is divided into five classes of IP addresses. You don't need to be able to calculate subnet masks, but you should be able to recognize these five classes and the number of addresses in each class. Class A networks provide 2 to the power of 24 addresses, 16,777,000 and 214 usable addresses. Class B provides 2 to the power of 16 addresses, 65,534 usable addresses. And class C provides 2 to the power of 8 addresses, which is 254 usable addresses. The final piece that you should remember related to IP version 4 addresses is that three ranges of addresses have been reserved for use in private networks, home networks, corporate networks, etc. The entire 10.0 range, the 172.16 to 172.31 range, and the 192.168 range. Any of the private IP addresses in the three ranges above are not routable on the internet. All sorts of specialty networks have been developed over the years. The plain old telephone system, surveillance camera networks, storage area networks, etc. Many of these specialty networks have required proprietary protocols and specialized dedicated networks. The whole idea behind convergence is this. Rather than having a completely separate network for all our security cameras, why not just plug them into our existing IP data network? Or hey, rather than keeping this old dedicated phone network around, let's just plug the phones into our IP data network. Converged protocols 
are taking these specialty or proprietary protocols and running the traffic through a standard TCP IP network, thus eliminating the need for separate networks that can be expensive to maintain. VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, is a perfect example of a converged protocol. You're taking telephone voice data and sending it across a TCP IP local area network and across the internet. A couple of other converged protocols that you should be aware of are both related to storing and retrieving data across IP networks. iSCSI, Internet Small Computer Systems Interface, and FCOE, Fiber Channel over Ethernet. Something we need to do all the time on networks is authentication. For example, authenticating a client to a server. Many authentication protocols have been created over the years. Let's go through a few of the ones that you should know about for the exam. Password authentication protocol is one of the oldest authentication protocols, and it is absolutely useless from a security perspective, as both the username and password are sent in clear text, in plain text. I need to find some good stock footage of a dumpster fire for when I talk about protocols like this. The Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, CHAP, sends the authentication data in plain text, but does so in a much cleverer way. And in fact, that's where the challenge part comes in from the name of this protocol. The server generates a random string, a challenge, and sends it to the client. The client then feeds their password and the challenge into the MD5 hashing algorithm and sends the hash result to the server. The server can then confirm that the user knows their password without the user sending their password across the network in plain text. The hash value that the client generates can be sent in plain text because as we discussed in domain three, hashing is one-way mathematical function, and therefore a man-in-the-middle attack cannot determine the user's password by intercepting the hash value. Like I said, clever. The extensible authentication protocol was originally developed as an authentication protocol for the point-to-point -point PPP protocol, but EAP is widely used for authentication on wireless LANs, wireless LANs, and even WiMAX. It is so widely used because it is extremely flexible and essentially provides a framework upon which all sorts of different authentication methods, EAP methods, can be used. A couple of EAP methods you should be familiar with. EAP slash MD5 uses the MD5 hashing algorithm and is pretty limited. For example, it only allows server authentication. EAP TLS, on the other hand, is way more secure and enables dual authentication of both the server and the client through the use of certificates. And the final authentication protocol we'll talk about isn't actually a standalone authentication protocol. It's just a wrapper for EAP. PEAP, protected EAP, encapsulates EAP within an encrypted TLS transport layer security tunnel, thus encrypting any EAP traffic that is being sent across a network. Here's a table that summarizes a few of the important types of EAP. Let's now shift gears and talk about some common types of network attacks and generally how network attacks are perpetrated. There are four major phases to a network attack that you should be familiar with. The defining characteristic of reconnaissance is that it is a passive activity. The organization that is being attacked has no way of detecting the attack at this phase because only publicly available information is being gathered from sources like job postings, LinkedIn profiles, and DNS records. Enumeration is where a network attack can begin to be detected because enumeration is an active activity. The attacker is enumerating, systematically scanning through IP address ranges and ports to look for live systems that are offering services. The attacker is scanning for potential targets of attack. Vulnerability analysis is where the attacker tries to determine the exact version of a system and identify potential vulnerabilities that could be exploited. And the final step, exploitation. The attacker will attempt to exploit any vulnerabilities identified. Now, on to some of the common types of network attacks. As I mentioned in the previous Domain 4 video, the prevailing network topology is bus, which means an attacker connected to the bus, connected to a wired or wireless network, can usually quite easily passively listen and eavesdrop on network traffic. This is eavesdropping, passively listening to network traffic. SIN flooding is a form of denial of service attack in which an attacker sends a succession of SIN packets to a target system in an attempt to consume enough resources that the target system is unresponsive to legitimate traffic. IP spoofing is where an attacker changes the source IP address of a packet to either hide the attacker's identity or to match another IP address on the network, thus allowing the attacker to pretend to spoof to be another system. Denial of service is an attack 
that negatively impacts the availability of the victim system, such that authorized users cannot access the system for business purposes. A distributed denial of service attack is simply a DOS attack that originates from multiple attacking systems, possibly thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of attacking systems focusing on one target system to make it unavailable. And then the middle attacks are where an attacker places themselves in the middle of computers which are communicating with each other, such that the attacker can intercept or even modify the communications between systems or maybe even block them. And finally, address resolution protocol poisoning is where an attacker modifies an address resolution protocol ARP table, often their own ARP table, such that the router reads the update and begins redirecting traffic to a new destination. For example, an ARP poisoning attack could cause traffic destined to the victim to actually be sent to the attacker instead. This is a way of establishing a man-in-the-middle attack through ARP poisoning. Next up, let's talk about how we can use virtualization to logically segment our networks and, with SDN, achieve some really cool security benefits. VLANs, Virtual Local Area Networks, allow you to logically segment a network. Put another way, you can segment a network through software instead of having to physically segment a network by buying and configuring new hardware. A VLAN can compromise a subset of the ports on a single switch or a subset of ports on multiple switches, thus allowing systems to be logically separated, segmented into groups. Network segmentation has a lot of security benefits, and VLANs can be a good way of achieving segmentation efficiently and economically. Software-defined networks, SDNs, are a massive leap forward in virtualization beyond just simple VLANs. An SDN allows you to create multiple, completely virtualized, software-controlled networks on top of a physical network. SDNs provide far greater flexibility to reconfigure a network rapidly by centralizing all the control of the virtualized network. SDNs are a critical part of what makes the cloud work. Fundamentally, SDN provides abstraction for network topology, network flow, and network protocols. Digging a little deeper into SDNs, we need to talk about northbound and southbound APIs. Northbound APIs allow applications to communicate with the SDN controller in the control plane. And southbound APIs allow the SDN controller to send commands down to the infrastructure components in the data plane. Okay, final section in this mind map. A very brief overview of some of the most common network tools we use to manage and maintain networks. IPconfig displays current TCP IP network configuration on an endpoint, for example, a computer, providing the IP and MAC addresses on any network interface cards in the system, plus the gateway, DHCP, and DNS IP addresses. Ping is used to determine the reachability of a host on an IP network. Ping is commonly used to see if a system is online and responding. Traceroute is used to display the route and transit delays of a packet across an IP network. You can see all the routers, gateways, firewalls, etc. that a packet is passing through to get to a destination, and how many milliseconds the packet is delayed at each hop. Whois is used to query databases that store the registered users of an internet resource like a domain name. You can use Whois to find out who is the owner of a domain name. And Dig is used to query DNS, domain name systems, to get all the details on a domain name, such as the name servers the domain name uses, the mail server, etc. All right, and that is an overview of networking within Domain 4, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. Have you downloaded our free OSI model cheat sheet yet? If not, why not? (laughs) It makes it super easy for you to memorize the critical protocols that I just covered in this mind map. Link to download this free PDF is in the description below. (music) 